am recording this after I recorded the main video that you're about to see. And so I just want to give some quick context. I gave this talk live for a thing at a club in my school. So I'll be reacting to chat. You'll be seeing Discord UI. That's just because the club president was doing that because there's recording issues. Anyway, you'll know what I mean when you see it. But I also want to mention that for my audience, I am going to be talking in the context of 5e because that is the dominant game run at that club and that organization. However, for those of you that are coming from the 5e audience, I will be talking about other systems and making a lot of comparisons. I'm not doing that to addition more. I'm doing it for the sake of being able to talk about some of the design decisions that D&D made and what other alternatives exist. Because a lot of people assume D&D's design philosophy is how everything else works, when that really isn't the case. And I really wanted to highlight that in systems that are, albeit, really similar in terms of tone and genre. So, with that, let's just get started. Welcome to Learn to Dragon 2 Encounter Design with Sean Pathfinder. <laughs> And um, this looks like it's going to be quite fun. Uh, let's let's start off with a bit of the uh, good old introductions. Um, hi, I'm Merrick. I'm the president of the Dragon Club here at UC Davis. And this is Sean. Sean, who are you? What are you doing here? <laughs> Oh, uh, Mike, more. Mike made up. You may have to repeat that. <laughs> I think your mic was, Mike was cutting out. Cutting out a little bit. Okay. Well, whatever. Uh, I also am a member of Dragon Club, and I've been doing a YouTube thing for a bit now. I was involved in some pretty fun stuff on there, involving collabs with creators that I have no business collaborating with. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I got dragged along via Ronald the Rules Lawyer and his series. So I end up collabing with really big names like uh, DM Lair and Treant Monk and people like that. Oh, cool. Nice. So you're, you're a bit of a, a big shot. So, we, got a, we got someone for real up in here doing this, uh, this, <laughs> this seminar, I suppose. I mean, I played like three games with them for content. And that counts as a collab. Um, that's cool. That's fun. So, like, All that's right. one of my big gaming achievements in terms of the scale of things. So, um, how many? How and, do you run uh, Pathfinder, or what's that looking like right now? So, I'm gonna be honest. It's about thirty minutes prep per session, <laughs> and only ten of it is encounter building. Nice. Um, how long have you been running Pathfinder? Uh, Pathfinder for the does club? a lot of stuff to making. Yeah, for my Pathfinder, I've been running for the club because Pathfinder does a lot of things to make encounter building very, very automatic. Mm -hmm. And if I need to build a custom creature, it takes me like 10, 15 minutes at most. Nice. So it's very much there. And so I'm going to be pointing out how to do things in 5e because I also have like four years of running DD 5 under my belt, getting to high levels. And then burning out because I saw the amount of work that I need to do for everything. <laughs> so I'm going to highlight the amount of work that you need to do for everything in order to make it great. While contrasting that with other systems that ha find other ways to do combat balance. All right. And uh, then <laughs> showing how you can steal rules. Yeah. Before we start that, though, um, what's your experience like with D&D Club? Like how many, you know, how long have you been running stuff? Uh, what kind of stuff do you run? And then we can get right into the encounter building nonsense <laughs> so in terms of D, D clubs i've been in before the main one is this one but before that i actually made a D, &D club in my high school but that one had a lot of issues notably gms wouldn't show up when they said they would and That's so i put one. myself in as a flex that would just kind of have one page one shots that would just like everybody whose gm didn't show up without any notice come join my thing so i'd be running these one page games for like eight people at once so that's my experience with public games is doing that or doing the organized thing at dragon where i then set up here's how you can join my thing and play and blah blah, blah. yeah and i've had a great time being at dragon players show up when they say they do i think that's just because of the maturity of the audience of uc davis student versus high schooler <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, that's that's great to hear. All right, so um, so we can start this, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> what is a good encounter trademarked? And uh, do I have to buy right. the rights to to make an encounter? How does this work? You do. Funny. And is my mic still working? Yep, it is. Okay. okay well, the TM symbol is just yeah. funny. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be very much looking at that green box. So let's yeah. go ahead and get started. So what are we talking about? And combats, duh. But what is in the games and for what reasons? Because that's the philosophy behind your games. It'll tell you a lot about how you're supposed to be running them. I'm going to be taking a mechanics-oriented view, mostly because... The fluff and how you describe things can change a lot table to table, depending on what people are comfortable with, depending on what genre you're playing. And I think that analyzing mechanics can give us a structured basis to then work from. So we're going to be focusing on mechanics, starting broader, getting more specific with each section. So we'll be constantly going in and out. And we're going to focus on the niche subgenre of dungeon crawler fantasy with a resource slash tactical focus that uses a d20 for resolution of specific actions. Okay, so that's basically D&D &D and Pathfinder. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, and quick interjection. Um, this isn't just a presentation. It's, of course, a seminar type thing. So um, we will be trying to take questions during the presentation. I'll let you know if there's you know, yep. question you want to ask and answer and whatnot. And those in the audience... Uh, please leave questions or like clarifying questions or, you know, comments, I suppose, in the chat, and we'll get to those when we can. Thank you. And I will let you know, I have exact slides where there are breaks where I will then answer every question in chat. That's cool. That sounds good. Because right before I move on to another topic, we'll answer everything. And I have exact slides in here for that. Good. So what makes a combat fun? First question, because it's a big one, and it's one that we need to answer. And I think it comes down to three-ish things, and that is tension meaningful choices, and story implications. I think that if you have two of the three, you're usually doing pretty well. And a system choice will impact how all three work. So tension. Tension is made of two parts. The threat, which is like you have a poison bottle. And then the proof, which is how much damage that poison actually deals. It is going to hurt if you try to do anything with it. Um, but what happens when you neglect one part of that equation? Well, if you have no threat, seriously harming a PC with no warning. <laughs> and if you have no proof behind it, you lose the ability to make any threat believable if the players figure this out. And so then you lost trust with your players, and that's also very bad. So let's talk about the default stakes of a 5e encounter. In D&D and Pathfinder, that is the death of that character. That is the default stakes. People are playing for keeping their characters alive to get to the next combat, etc. It's a very harsh penalty. So you need to find, oh, until Revivify comes in, but still, you should just kind of not want to follow through on it because killing a PC is a lot. And even if it is a minor setback in terms of mechanics, the fiction idea of my character is dead especially to a new player that doesn't know how easily come by these resurrections are holds a lot of power and a lot of bad feelings behind it so you need to be careful and if it's so harsh and you don't want to do it let's find some stakes that you are more willing to execute on so alternative stakes these come into like story stuff but time pressure is a big one if you need to get to X before Y happens, the goal is now to beat it quickly. Do it with the minimal amount of rest. Do a big time pressure goal of, okay, this room is going to fill with water in an hour. We don't have time for a short rest. How do we conserve our resources getting through? An escort quest. Now you're killing an NPC who the players don't care about as much and you're more willing to do. Because if you're a GM, everything in your world should be looked at to, how can I break this to hurt my players? Um... <laughs> And burn resources, of course, because in D&D 5e, not every fight is expected to kill the players. Some of them are just there to make sure they don't have those higher level resources for a fight that could be threatening. And in the Dungeon Master's Guide, you are expected to do six to eight medium to hard difficulty encounters a day. That is the amount of burning resources 5e expects you to be applying. And I'd say you can get by on a much lower number at the lower levels. 
But once you start running high level D&D, you feel why they recommend six to eight very hard. And there's the page number if somebody wants to reference that. And Mm -hmm. this leads to what I call filler encounters, which are just encounters that are there to burn resources. And I find those not very interesting to play. And that's one of the major reasons that pushed me away from 5e. Because you need to find some way to apply time pressure to burn the resources that they can't rest. And I got tired of doing that legwork for all this time. Yeah, three to four sessions of encounters per long runs. <laughs> it's absurd. <laughs> and that's why I'm pointing it out here. It, so if you feel like your party always has the resources and you can't get tension, that's probably why. Because the system was not really designed with the intent of a GM having an easy time running. And I'll get to that later in like a very end section. And let's do an example of an encounter. You are traveling with some merchants and are attacked by bandits. All right. Fight goes on for a normal while. The party will win. Just they will because the bandits aren't going to be that strong. You're seasoned venturers, whatever. But one of the bandits grabs some jewels and runs. Now the party has a choice. Do you go chase after that bandit and possibly let these NPCs that are in the caravan get hurt? Or do you protect the NPCs and let them get away with the jewels? You present a choice that they then need to make. And you can do this by doing a situation and having alternate stakes. So, any questions on this topic before I start moving on? Uh, I guess I can ask a question. Uh, (laughs) Go for it. I guess it's not really a question, but um, God, it takes so long to run... Six to eight encounter. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. But, Especially uh, if people don't know their characters or whatever. But the Dungeon Master's Guide recommends six to eight. How do you sell the stakes? Great question. The answer is by proving you're not kidding somehow. And when you're th- thinking about killing a player character, they're like, you're not going to kill me on a random encounter. You're going to have the thing run away because it's low HP. And that's what the player's likely thinking. But would you let a thief get away with the jewels? Oh, you absolutely would. Oh, you will. I mean, <laughs> I do too. Uh, what, I have had one player character at that dragon, and that was due to a random encounter. Um, <laughs> to be fair, the player was asking for it. Um, yeah, it running after an owlbear that is protecting its young to try and skin it when you're already injured is a bad idea. Just um, like Baldur's Gate. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. Yeah. So that is what you need to do. You need to have something that you're willing to sell the party on that this is dangerous. So if you have a sniper, the premium way to demonstrate that is have an NPC companion with the party who gets headshot immediately. And then you say, look, that is what's going to happen. <laughs> ah, a sniper over there. <laughs> that's, te- that's, that's pretty horrible. I love that. <laughs> so that's what I recommend doing. What if the PCs don't care about uh, the NPC? (laughs) Then find something else that they do care about that you can throw (laughs) them. That's if they only care about their own character sheets, you then need to play a far more lethal game to have tension. And that's just a downside of that system. If the players do not care about the world, they only care about their own characters. You need to threaten their characters and only their characters, which is unfortunate. But in my experience, that hasn't been like, an issue for me but i could see that being an issue for other people i mean most players do like at least try to give an effort to like care about the world especially you know if you have yeah. something that you're building all that kind of stuff if it is completely random like you know because like sparky's one shots and whatnot like there can be a lack of investment i think that could yeah. become an issue but um i think the majority of games you're going to have more investment, I think, in the world and, And you know, like, the jewels or whatever. (laughs) And at that point, you could also say that somebody needs to be always holding this power core, and you can have somebody try to use athletics checks to try and rip that out of their hands and then have the thing there, but it's going to be much harder if the players have a lower investment in your game. Um, But, yeah, that's just naturally an issue that will come across. Speaking of tension, let's get into that now. I believe that we're done tension. We're now into choice. Okay, choice. Why does choice matter exactly? And I'm just going to present another example. Let's imagine a rework of 5e's combat engine to make it faster. You roll a d20, 
And if you get 20 or higher, you get out with no resource loss at all. On a zero, a character dies. On a minus 10, you TPK, and counters have a modifier to affect the difficulty. Why isn't this fun? Nobody's know. making any decisions. <laughs> Nobody's making any decisions. The character decisions don't matter. And even if you say, let the caster spend spell slots to add modifiers after the fact, it's still no interesting decisions are being made. No choices are being made. It's all just calculations of, oh, this is just objectively correct. We just roll the die, see what happens. Nothing matters. And the bandit scenario presents a choice. Do you chase after the guy with the jewels or do you protect the people that are the thing? If nothing else is going on, it's not really a meaningful choice for a lot of characters. <clears throat> I chase after the bandit becomes pretty easy if you have a healer that can just heal the people that are being attacked. But if you are the healer and another PC is also dying on the ground while everything else is happening, now that healer has a big choice to make. It's very difficult to present these choices in 5e's engine. <laughs> and it's near trivial to do that in Pathfinder. So let's show this by just saying you're playing some kind of marshal. Let's say a fighter for this example. What do you do when fighting bandits? You attack as many times as your extra attack allows you, maybe action surge. Same when fighting a troll, same when fighting a dragon, and same when just about every single fight where something's in range of you. There really isn't a decision being made other than Am I burning my action surge this turn? And you need to have a secondary condition to give the marshals much of a choice. Because in 5e, the baseline assumption is choices come from, am I spending resources here? And I don't find that a particularly engaging question if my hour-long combat hinges on it. So as such, Pathfinder 2e has a different way of presenting choice. For example, you think of like the fighter build with an open offhand. So here are a few of their options at level one. Uh, snagging strike, which lets you hit somebody and make them off guard, which is just like a different status little penalty. They could move to get into a flanking position. Uh, they could heal an ally because they were a field medic in their background. They could try and aid somebody. They could try and intimidate an enemy to make them afraid. They could trip somebody. They could grapple uh, at level one. Um, so they have a lot of options. And now let's go over the same scenarios. When fighting a bunch of bandits, you're likely going to try and move with your allies to get into a flank position without exposing your back too hard. You're going to be against a troll trying to trip it because it has a very low reflex. When fighting a dragon, uh, you die. Um, and when you fight, you do a different decision for each different enemy. Secondary conditions are the name of the game Pathfinder, which is why it has the background of being such a more complex game or that reputation because it has these conditions and presents these choices at a frequency that some players may not be comfortable with. Because every turn you are making two to three meaningful decisions. And for a lot of players that don't really want to think that hard, and I'm not using that as an insult, I mean that 5e is built for the type of player that just kind of wants to be there and hang out with the friends. So due to that, Pathfinder has a different goal, and it's easier to build these choices into the game. And it's easier to make the combat engaging because it has this legwork there for you. But they're also the narrative first pathway. <clears throat> it can be options paralysis, and I'm going to just quickly acknowledge that here. And there is a definite reason it isn't, and it's because you build your own character, and I specifically picked a fighter with an open offhand because they have a billion options at level one. On average, a character might have three options. Like if you're a great weapon fighter, you have like aid, demoralize, attack, move. That's kind of it. And even then, the aid and the demoralize are things that you do after you've already attacked because attacking is so much better than the other options. So in a narrative first game, it's a bit different. You make environments apply different things. So if somebody describes himself as being higher up on a rock, you give them like a little bonus. You can give them damage for environmental interaction, like trying to shoot an arrow through a fire to get a flaming arrow, have do a little bit of extra fire damage. And how you present the character and how they present their combat then becomes the focus rather than what tactics is the player actually using. 
It becomes a matter of what is the character doing that affects the outcomes of the fight. And this is then very open for what do you want to do with it. And the systems de-emphasize the G part because a lot of these games don't even have a set turn order. You're just kind of jumping in and saying, I want to do this. And then the GM is announcing what the creatures does and all flows. And it puts more emphasis on the role playing, even in the combat. And I also really enjoy those systems. And let's talk about how you can homebrew in choices into 5e. So if you want to do the Pathfinder method, you keep the action economy basically as is, but you make other things compete for that main action. Magic items that have several cool activations that maybe are all tied to the same resource. So the players that even are marshals may now have a magic sword that lets them self-cast haste. Or they can change its mode and do a fireball. And now they have the choice of when am I burning resources, when am I doing my basic attack, similar to what a caster would. And you can also have be a bonus action to swap forms. So that way they're thinking about, okay, what form do I need to be in for next turn? Because I have a bonus action this turn and it gets players to think about how they're attacking. When am I going to be burning these? Uh, or you could do something like give everybody battle master maneuvers. I think that's a good example of base 5e giving choice. Quick clarification. So this is, we're just talking about marshals here, right? Because it seems... Casters are fine. Of... Okay. All right. That's a uh, casters game. in the base game, they have a choice <laughs> of which of my 12 spells am I casting this turn? Yeah. And so like, even if we look at a warlock who has a very low amount of decisions, they still have like eight known spells sometimes. It's yeah, like, yeah, they have Eldritch the Blast as their default, but they can then do these other spell slots. And they have these other actives to then dip into to then be efficient. And so mostly harping on marshals having no decisions, because if I say casters have no decisions, I'm just wrong. Mm -hmm. A good caster player always has decisions to make. <laughs> and monsters with mechanics that require response are another thing that you can rip from Pathfinder, because all the Pathfinder actives are things that require the players to do something or make them change their tactics in some way. So the rules of the game affect what options your characters have, the freedom they have to use those options, what option is best in any given scenario, when you can use those things, and D&D rules as world building is a different talk that would happen way later. But for now, let's do an example of healing tactics and how different game engines affect them. So 5e, healing is very stingy with numbers, very low amounts that you're actually healing, but very lenient with how you get knocked out. You just use some movement to stand up, pick up your weapons with item interaction, you're good. It's best to wait for someone to get knocked out to actually heal them because they're up to fighting strength again and you just have their knockout absorb the extra damage. Mm -hmm. So it creates a scenario where the safest you are in 5e is actually knocked out right before the healer's turn. Which is really strange. Healing Pathfinder is generous with the healing number. Yes, uh, I see that comment of really, and if you the healers, they meet it next turn, you're basically safe. Unless somebody's actually attacking the down PC, they're very unlikely to die. And so <laughs> getting knocked out in 5e isn't actually scary unless you're having several people around you or people with multi-attack around you. Four goblins with daggers. <laughs> <laughs> Four goblins with daggers <laughs> surrounding you as you get knocked out. That's terrifying. Um, Rules is written, of course. You just die if they all hit you, which is great. <laughs> yep. And because anyway. uh, you're knocked out, crits, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. PF2E, generous with the healing number, you mostly do that middle one where it's a D8 plus 8 per spell level of somebody getting healed. And you need that healing because crits are more often and double all of the incoming damage. And knockouts hurt, because for death saves, uh, you die dying four, but you start dying one, and dying two if you got crit. Being healed makes you one higher dying on your next knockout. You drop prone, you drop all your stuff, action to stand up, action to pick up each individual item, and you fall in initiative order as well. <laughs> if you implement some of these things, you can make going down a much bigger threat, even if your party is built around popcorn healing. Someone getting knocked down Pathfinder is a sign that this encounter 
just got awful. Because <laughs> you are now going to have to fight with three quarters of your party strength for a round. Because that person's going to need a while to pick themselves back up, even if you do heal them. Now I'll take the questions on this type of choice. Frustrations with spellcasting is real. Um, oh, I, I have... I have a deep dive into one spell for encounter balancing, which I think might be the next section. Let me just check. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm glad we're going to get to it. But, um, but yeah, a small comment on spellcasting and choice and options. Um, mm-hmm. The monk is pretty much like the biggest example I want to bring up right now. The, fi- the D&D 5e yeah. monk. And um, a lot of people really don't like the monk for various reasons, but um, I think that as like a like a marshal, um, actually answer the answer the healer question first. Is the healer allowed um, to cast? Freely? Why is the healer allowed to cast freely? Uh, because they are a forge cleric with a twenty one AC. Boom. <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot well of ways then. you can build well a caster okay. to be as untouchable as a marshal. A caster can be a tank in 5e. That is true. And if you're talking about a Pathfinder caster, then that's a much more complicated question that we'll all need to have an understanding of Pathfinder to do. Um, don't the rules for spell cast also affect the healer? Yeah. But I'm talking about when you would actively choose to use healing. You don't choose to heal people unless they're already super low and are basically knocked out. It is limited by slots, but then you're going to need to burn resources if you want to actually have death be a threat or play at a low level where resources are lower. And at high levels, you do need to get to that six to eight mark because otherwise mass healing word from two people that have it can just pick up an entire party on each healer's turn. Yeah, depending. Prone potentially bad after being knocked prone down. It, that is very true. Prone just has people get advantage on attacking you. And you can just use half your movement to stand. I don't actually like... It doesn't I, cost I, you I any really action. I don't like that rule. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. I don't like it as well. Um, no, I was that's why Baldur's Gate could completely eat your character's action if you got knocked out. Yeah. yeah. Baldur's Gate says for- you stood up. You don't have an action yeah. anymore. As informed so Baldur's Gate made idea. standing a full action. Um, Baldur's Gate did some very other interesting decisions, though, like initiative is rolled with a d4, which is <laughs> weird. But I think broadly, Baldur's Gate made very good decisions for making the game more tactical. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Yo-yo healing moment. Now, on, tactical. Uh, tactical as in more likely that you need to make big decisions. Through bonus actions, giving marshals a resource. That's why I talked about earlier. With it, depending on their weapon group, so there's a choice in build. What if players don't care for tactics? Then you can go for the rules light method or keep 5e as is. I'm not saying you need to do this. I'm saying this is why encounters might be lackluster. You should think of this as like an exploration of why the design is this way. And I'll be acknowledging that a lot of players might not like this. And that there are rules light methods to make the encounters more engaging. And I'll be going over modifications to do that as well. Yeah. All right, balance. <laughs> is Pathfinder actually more deadly? <laughs> well, if the GM tunes it that way. L- let's talk about encounter balance real quick. Uh, so, encounter balance in 5e. As per th- the descriptions of the things, hard has to be a very... very... Hey, hold on a second. Your mic uh, went out again. Yeah. Sounds like it keeps unplugging. So, now I made sure it's fully in. Okay, good. Deadly is the only encounter that mentions the party actually risking defeat. And you don't have language for anything above that risk of defeat. Mm -hmm. But, let's just kind of move on from that, because you can just set your own XP thresholds. Let's see how you do that. Jeez. Okay, so here's the XP threshold chart. (laughs) Yeah, that is in the Dungeon Master's Guide, and you multiply that number by the number of characters in your party, which already were kind of exiting the realm of mental math. And I'm going to note that now, 
And I'm also going to note, this is not a linear scale. You cannot memorize this. Because look, uh, just how the deadly things move from levels 1 to 5. 100, 200, 400, 500, randomly lower, and then over double. You can't memorize this table. It doesn't come <laughs> from logic. <laughs> so you are already ne needing to look this up if you want to do it by hand. And then let's just use an example of an orc is worth 100 XP. You then get the XP of the monster, and then you fill that XP budget. Except that also has a multiplier at the end based on the amount of creatures in the encounter. And uh, then you give up and use Kobold Fight Club. Not and this is how method. most people do encounter building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I just want to point out a few things about how weird the math is around this that you might not have realized. So here I made a spreadsheet of how many orcs does it take to make an encounter deadly. And I have the blue line there be the unmodified total. The only thing that is changing is the number of characters in this party. So without the multiplier, you see that you need two orcs per player. Reasonable. But otherwise, your one character party needs 1.5 orcs-ish. <laughs> then it gets to a one-to-one -one ratio eventually, and that starts being the players outnumber the orcs by the end. Because the only thing that's changing is the amount of players in this thing. They're always a deadly encounter per the game balance. So there's a link to the spreadsheet, and I'll post these slides after I'm done. And it poorly controls for party size. <laughs> so why have that multiplier there? And I want to explain this through the 5e action economy and a spell. Conjure animals. God. Those of you who are seasoned 5e GMs will know where this is going very quickly. Because conjure animals gives you a little choice. 1 CR2, 2 CR1s, 4 CR1 halves, blah, 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 all the way down to 16 CR1 eighths. But let's talk about an example CR2 animal. Here we can see that this guy has a plus six to hit, can deal 15 damage, can possibly knock people prone. Cool. And a fighter at this level, if they're using like a bow, would have a higher to hit and similar on average damage because, you know, let's say they're doing, you know, 17 damage on average. This seems fair for a spell that a cast would do. Get a creature that they then fight with. And then 16 flying snakes is on the other side of the field. And the snakes <laughs> deal 1 plus 3d4 damage. So when you multiply that by 16, you're getting 135 damage a round. A round. This is a spell that lasts, by the way. It's concentration one hour. And you might say, oh, but if you read the text of the spell, it doesn't say the player gets to pick what they summon. They just pick the amount. Okay, so let's say you just be very rude to them. Uh, by the way, 16 <laughs> snakes. Um, and you just do a bunch of diseased rodents, okay? Well, these things have their power budget put into the fact that they have a disease that they can apply. So it isn't very useful in a short-term encounter. So you as a GM might say, yeah, there are rats around here. They're diseased. Sure, you can have 16 of these. And then you realize that they're still dealing 72 damage on average with pack tactics. A swarm of lower level creatures is much stronger than one higher level creature, even if the XP would add up to the same amount. Because that big Allosaurus, you notice, it had 450 XP given. And then you add up the XP budget there, and it's 25 times 16, which is, on my calculator here, 25 times 16, 400. Less XP if you don't have the multiplier. Um, it feels like they did not consider action economy in design because they didn't <laughs> things like the multiplier is weird because of action economy. But if you look at the rats and the contra animals, they just forgot about that multiplier for the contra animals. So, you know. yes, they just completely forgot about the multiplier. So it's a great example for why that multiplier has to exist. So if you want to balance that it, that is why you'll s <laughs> just put the multiplier. And back I in. would assume that. And so we have a fuzzy term of deadly. We have a fuzzy measure of what deadly means based on the party size. We have a fuzzy measure of what this multiplier is because it has random numbers where it just jumps up. So it isn't a continuous scale. It's all very strange. And so what I do as the GM is I look at their average damage and their two hit and their hit points. And I just can't eyeball it. Because I think the math doesn't work anyway. Eyeballing it is just as accurate. And 
spells are just gross <laughs> if i'm being honest <laughs> they're the only real way to heal others consistently deal area damage have good minions uh lamau to the ranger players out there uh i know swarm keeper exists now but lamau to the ranger players out there um buff the math of the game with stuff like bless uh and counter spells Th- there's a lot of encounters to burn all of this stuff that they can do and so that's why there's the six to eight number. That's why there's the multiplier and the CR calculations. That's why a lot of this stuff exists. 5e's design is pretty fundamentally based around the idea of we're going to make this as easy as possible for a brand new player that doesn't know how the action economy works. And we're going to include things that make people feel smart for figuring them out by giving them the ability to break the game. And 5e was trying to serve those two purposes. And I think that. I'm kind of in the middle where I want to play a tight game where people are thinking and doing their best to win. Yeah. Question. Um, and so, so going back a little bit here, um, the idea of like Sparky asked, what if the PCs don't oh, no, no, That's not the right one. Uh, there wasn't specifically blah, blah. What if players don't care for tactics? Um, the basic idea, the thing I wanted to ask is, um, do you think that there is like, like how much is too much really? Like, I, I think that the spells, like a wizard or whatever has like, you know, 16 potential spells at like level four, like it's, it's a lot. Um, yeah. And do you think it's better to just have like a ton of options to pick through or better if they're just like more tuned, like a couple things that, you know, make sense to affect the I game? I think the best scenario is you present a player with three options that are all good. I think that's what I'd go for. Mm -hmm. Because, like, if you're a wizard and you're in a swarm encounter, your options are fireball, web, or do a cantrip. That's really three good options. There's a lot of noise in that decision because of how the spell list works, but you fundamentally have only a few things that you're choosing between, and all three of those things can be good. Um, can we clarify what uh, threshold level ups mean? Is that like milestone level ups? Because yeah, people. Do I'm gonna really assume that like means milestone, and milestone. Uh, you just use milestone, and you just kind of use the XP as the way to figure out how many creatures to throw at people. Yeah, that's and that's all you the use best it for. Way. You don't have to award the XP after the fight. And also, I should mention that little XP number that's written in parentheses. That's how much XP you would give your players because you give them the unmultiplied total. Divided about among the amount of players, so you better have calculator on hand that's ready to divide by four. I think that. <laughs> um, so to answer this question, I'll, I'll just answer this one. This is fun. Um, how does milestone yeah. affect balancing encounters? Um, basically, milestone mm-hmm. makes it so you don't have to run six to eight encounters per day to level up your characters. Basically, like yeah. milestone is just so that you don't have to run x amount of xp times the number of party members in order to actually level up your party so you can yeah. still balance pretty easily with milestone leveling Mi- um yeah milestone does not affect your day-to-day balancing it affects the speed characters level up on a grand scale that's all it affects so it literally does not change the encounter balance yeah what would change encounter balance is if you gave people magic items or whatever so there was a point in my high-level game when I was balancing the party as if they were three levels higher than what they were. Because they just had magic items, and I need to balance around that. They had casters that had healing spells, so I needed to figure out ways around that, and I did that by simply giving myself much larger XP budgets. Right. And so that's how I do a patch job solution to my encounters don't feel scary enough. Yeah. So... Now let's move into system philosophy. This is where I'm going to go into why is 5e like this and why are other systems not like this? So PF2e encounter building is different. The chance for characters to die happens at moderate and severe. That's where 5e deadly lands. And that gives you language for things harder than that. Extreme threat is 50-50 chance of TPK. That is the hardest difficulty that Pathfinder lists. And these labels are all incredibly accurate. Basically, 1 to 20, because Pathfinder designed its math. At the start of the game, when they were designing, and said, this will be our math, because I know it will do this thing. 
And Mark Seifter was the guy who did all that math together. And I was actually on a podcast with him once. So that's cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm allowed to flex when it's relevant. Same. And so it's these two tables and that's it. You have the encounter budget for how hard you want your encounter to be. The character adjustment is how much per character XP budget is for four players. And also the XP award for a given difficulty of fight. If you are using XP. And then the creature and role is based on their relative level to the party. A creature that's on party level is 40. And every two levels, you either have it or double it. And for encounter budget, extreme is the 40 XP for all the players. Hey, 50-50 of TPK. Because a level of creature is equal to a level of player. So there you go. And then moderate is half, severe is three quarters. And it just all flows out naturally. So I just memorize those few rules and I can generate these tables easily from the top of my head. And it's all just dividing by two. So it's mental math. And it works. And I just want to go over a couple Pathfinder creatures because I think they're interesting. The trolls here is one of the most simple creatures. It has pretty beefy damage because 5e balances their creatures. That way they are basically hit sponges because they found their testing that doing a lot of damage is fun. But how do we do a lot of damage while keeping things be a threat? We give them a lot of HP. So a lot of encounters in 5e come down to whittling down HP sponges. Pathfinder fights come down to this thing can crit us and kill us. How do we avoid that range so it comes along to affecting the D20? And trying to nudge that by plus minus one. Because they overhit you by 10, you get crit. <laughs> and dragons have far too many abilities, as is tradition. And mm. owl bears also have some pretty fun things like they can run up to you and scream to make you frightened which will thus make you not want to engage them for a while because it gives you a penalty until a certain amount of turns pass they can gnaw on your insides if they have you grabbed to get, make you sickened which is further status penalties and they have all these abilities compared to multi-attack and the ability to smell you um <laughs> so that's how you Pathfinder and counter building creates its decisions. They make monsters that have a few interesting abilities and then force players to move around that. Dungeon World instead describes a creature and then leaves it to the GM to decide how they actually fight. So, for example, you have a bunch of orcs that don't really fear death, do pretty low damage, but in the tags, they come in a horde. So, you have a lot of these things, they can swarm you, and then they all add their damage together. And you need to describe what you are doing to get out of this because you don't have default abilities written on your sheet like, oh, I know I can second wind to heal myself. It's how are you avoiding this orc swinging for your neck? How are you reacting to it? Let's now make a die check. And dragons only have 16 HP in that system because one of their key goals was to make combat fast. So they actually deflated a lot of those HP things, gave the dragon mass resistance. So you need to actually hit it with big individual hits try and take it out to create this epic fight it gives advantage on damage which is a crazy mechanic and it also lets it rip off your limbs so that way in this fiction first game you have to describe how you're moving around without one of your legs that's how they make their dragon scary not a fear aura like what Pathfinder and D&D do they make them scary by making you the player scared <laughs> That's great. That is because crazy. after you see something take off half your character's HP and the GM announces, and there goes your arm that was holding your sword. Like, what do you do at that point? <laughs> and that's how they make that character, these creatures scary. It's a different style of philosophy that yeah. isn't based in, I have an action surge per day, but it's more based in what is the world doing? Mm -hmm. And so, why did D&D pick the decisions they did? Because they did have reasons. The encounter building is weird. It is stilted. It is not great for building encounters, but there are reasons for it. And that is because they believe that all creatures should be able to do things against all levels as one of their first tenants that they written down. OP stuff is fun, but needs a limiter of some kind. At the same time, everything needs to be simple for brand new players. So that led to a lot of those limiters being resource-based. And then that also led to advantage disadvantage only, which limited the amount of status conditions they can make. And there are no, as I said, no convoluted drawbacks. 
the game system should determine your success, not the environment. So that way you don't have one asshole GM at a convention ruining your experience. And so they were trying to protect the people against things like that so they could do society play, so that they could do these things. And there should be a potent reward for system mastery. For the people that put the time in, learn all the edge cases, they should be able to do stuff that is really awesome and big and maybe breaks the game a bit. <laughs> and you can see that all these are like pretty honorable goals. But you can also see how a lot of the things that 5e has that are weird and are counterproductive come out of these honorable goals. And so I'm not going to say that 5e is a terrible game because it is good for a specific section of players. I just think that that section of players is not all players. Yeah. And I think that for a lot of groups that are new to games, I'd start them with something more rules like, like Dungeon World because that removes things from, okay, what am I doing? But I know that D&D has the sheet there and those definite actions as a guardrail. So that way players don't go, I have no idea what to do. What do I do? Because in 5e, you can always say, well, you can attack him. You can shoot a cantrip. And there's always something that they can do very easily so that they can get the attention off of them if they are shy. That is an honorable goal. And I do not want to make it sound like I'm hating everything that's like that because that is a legitimate player and they deserve to enjoy these games too. And 5e is very good for that type of player. I'm not going to take that away from 5e. But I will say that after you start trying to learn its internal workings, it then gets very difficult to learn. And that's why it becomes such pain to GM. Because they decide to do the rules in such a way that the brand new player doesn't do a lot of work. And they put a lot of that rules focus on the GM. Yeah. Because the GM is an invested player. They're willing to put in that work. So what they do is they did that to onboard new players as fast as possible. GMs are a minority of players. So, yeah. And that's unfortunate. Just being honest, it 5e is a very hard system to game master. I think that Pathfinder and Dungeon World are both easier. They present their own challenges, but I think they're both easier than D&D. And so the end result is it's difficult to present choices because everything's in that binary advantage, disadvantage. A lot of status conditions are either you cannot play the game anymore and you make zero decisions or don't do a whole lot. The system gives very little support for anything out of combat. It's basically just skills and that's it. And skills have their own weirdness with them, but that's a different talk. Weirdness of the math is thrown to the GM because the GM needs to put the encounters together. Yeah. So the players are blind to it. <laughs> Power gamers can then decimate your encounter balance. And you need many encounters per day in order to challenge these casters because casters get more resources, more ways to spend these resources, and then scale exponentially. So this is where 5e leaves us in terms of drawbacks, but it comes from those honorable goals from before. And it's really in wrestling with 5e that I came to like, this is basically my issues with it. And that's why I started exploring other systems and to steal things and then decided, eh, why don't I just stay here? So PF2's balanced philosophy is if everyone plays well, your class is balanced. System mastery, the reward is you get to play more complex and interesting things. So they have the basic barbarians and the fighters for the people that don't want to think very much. But then they also have things like the investigator, which lets you pre-roll an attack against somebody to then know what you're going to attack them if you chose to, and then give you the option of what are you doing after that. So you aren't forced to play a complex class to get the most power out of something, because if you go onto Reddit, fighters are overpowered as every fifth post because they are 2% better on the DPR charts. <sighs> anyway, all characters have a similar max power. They don't print OP stuff. Errata it if it does manage to sneak through. And math being tight lets you make intensity naturally, so you don't need to fudge dice. But at the same time, there's a lot more front-loaded rules that you need to learn. That is the downside of Pathfinder. It's harder to get into as a brand new player if you don't have somebody to guide you through it. 
And that's why they focused on like making a really, really good beginner box that people can recommend and things like that to onboard. But it will fundamentally always be harder to onboard to Pathfinder. One, lack of brand recognition. Two, the fact that it does have this rules bloat. It does have a lot more rules than D&D 5e. Because the D&D 5e player handbook of like, here's everything a player can do. is like this thick. Pathfinder's version is like that thick. Uh, even after the remaster, which moved a lot of the lore stuff out of there, it's still a lot of decisions to make. And that can be too much for a new player. And I acknowledge that. It's my favorite system to run, but it's not for everybody. And so HP bars are super swingy, which is a good thing because that means you're always a couple hits away from possibly getting knocked out. Everyone needs to stay on their toes. Damage is tense. I can play a min-maxed pile of numbers in a group of new players and everybody can have a good time because I'm not stepping on anybody else's toes and just making them more efficient because I'm affecting statuses. GM can tune counters properly, even if every player is super min-maxing or none are because they just simply change their XP threshold by 20. But it is, again, more reading, more theory. <laughs> and you need to be ready to make these tactical decisions, which isn't for everyone. Yeah. And the PBTA philosophy is small modifiers meant to be improv heavy. If you're not comfortable improving, you will not be comfortable with these games. You need no turns. You need to keep things flowing like a conversation. So Shire voices are likely to get lost in the shuffle if the GM isn't shining a light on them. But it lets you present really unique scenarios without having a lot of rules behind them and just let the characters shine through, which is really powerful. And it also means that you spend less time prepping. So the end result is a game where roleplay matters more. Looser power sets can exist because in five year PF2, you need to find exactly how much it does in terms of exact dice and uses per day. The game runs overall faster, but... The shy players are overlooked. An excited player may try to do too much and take too much of the spotlight. And D&D math is a safety blanket for those shyer players to be able to know how they can affect the world. It gives you a basic way to say, I just want to hit the guy and your turn's over. So any questions on this front? Um, there is one from chat from um, <clears throat> Z individual. I have, excuse me. I have streamer mode enabled, so I yeah, can't OBS see Yeah, OBS streamer mode. Yep, yep. Yep. Anywho. Um, I'm familiar with streamer mode. The idea of <laughs> the matter of retaining those new players to learn to stay on board, ultimately falling again into the GM hands and the table. Um, that is a huge issue in 5e, because um, something I've yeah. noticed, like, personally, um, if you have, like, a bunch of players, like, new players, it's not easy mm -hmm. still. It's still not easy. No. <laughs> Like to teach what should be the main goal? Whatever the main goal should be. Uh, I, I can't <laughs> answer that question for you. It depends on the group. Yeah, I think um, that's the... But for me, yeah. I, I actually probably have the best single story for players refuse to learn mechanics ever. And it was, I was six sessions into running a game in the D&D club during its like first time when the GMs were actually showing up and whatever. And... This six session in, this rogue player, who's level three by this point, said to me, well, I don't see why I should learn how sneak attack works, because you always tell me if it applies. <laughs> it I had to take a deep breath at that moment, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Um, because like, I asked she... them to start tracking more of the rules, and that was like the response. Yeah, no, like, actually, I had to take a deep <laughs> breath to not rip their head thing. off right there. <laughs> yeah like <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh my god no same so reaction that, yeah no like i think that is probably the single oh i burned a few too um th that was like my first character death which was scripted but like we decided to burn the character sheet because we thought it was funny but we didn't have a lighter so we didn't on the stove it was a whole thing um that's funny that's cleaning really up the ash funny. was a pain <laughs> Uh, so, uh, there are also the players who sometimes just don't bother to learn. Yeah. And I found that there are way fewer of those when you start running Pathfinder because they very quickly go, this is boring because I don't know what to do and leave. Um, yeah. so the players that do stick around, I do think it's survivorship bias rather than Pathfinder has people learn better, which it might be because they can see the tactical depth right there. But I do think there's a heavy element of survivorship bias. 
I think that that's an interesting point. Um, this definitely this opens the conversation to like why play other systems. Like if you think about it, you yeah. know, okay, like five E has a lot of issues. I think that five E mm-hmm. and Pathfinder every system does. Like, well, yeah, of course, but um, like five you know, E and Pathfinder, they have like a similar thing they're kind of going for, where five E yes. is is closer to that simple kind of like, oh, I can play what I want. The GM is crying in the corner, but yeah. I can play what I want. Um, and then Pathfinder, mm-hmm. the GM is like, oh, we're having a great time, but the players are like you know fighting for their lives right if they if they aren't paying yeah, attention or and, something and you can also as a gm just simply balance it as like oh i'm going to just balance them as if they were one level lower yeah you could do that and, and you can yeah, of cool. course like do these types of things to make the game easier because it gives you a lot of dials to tune but like the default assumption of pathfinder is it's more deadly mm-hmm. because they give you the language to describe those more deadly encounters and because yeah. Pathfinder expects a lot of competency from the players in those deadly encounters. That's why it has that reputation. Not because it objectively is more difficult. Because any GM can just throw weak monsters at the players. Of course. So I don't necessarily think that logic is sound. But I will say that Pathfinder does expect more from the players. Yeah. Like as a default assumption, you can change the default assumption so as you can in any system. So they're going to be, basically, they're going to be players that like one over the other, obviously. Um, and that's just yeah. something you have to keep in mind. Like, don't be afraid. I yep. think the big advice is don't be afraid to let people just leave if they don't want to play. It's like, you know, pick up a new yep. video game or a new system or whatever. Sometimes you just yeah. don't, you realize you don't like it. And like, like you might you have really some do. people that bounce off Monster Hunter while you love it. Like, it's, yeah, exactly. it's nothing personal. Um, and that's kind of what I realized, that different games play different people. And yeah, yeah, the players should also respect the GM's time. And I agree with that, but that's a little out of scope for this conversation. So I'm going to be, be moving along because <laughs> we could uh, have a talk about, Ooh, what do we do about problem players? But that's a very different talk. Yeah. Very, maybe very at the different end. Talk. We can, we can get there. We can get there. Depending if we, we can get, time. we can talk about weird stuff at the end, it, as long as we have time and your computer has recording space. Um, <laughs> no, I'll be okay. Dude, so now we're gonna talk about- two terabytes. <laughs> We should be all right. All right. Oh, nice. Okay. So the story of the system. And this is where we're going to start talking about the story of fights. It's a touch out of scope, but you know, it's important this time. So let's talk about how levels work in D&D versus Pathfinder 2, because I think there's a very big highlighting thing of how the systems treat their world differently because of their rules. In D&D, dragons can be killed by enough guards. You can use a wide variety of creatures against each level and more levels feel samey. What is the difference in game feel between levels 7 and 8? That's when characters get their second feet, by the way, for those who don't know. This is the same for every class. They all get a a second or third feet if they're a fighter. There really isn't a meaningful game difference between 7 and 8. I can't even say a new spell level got unlocked because that only happens at all levels. The only thing that really changes is your main stat increases by 2. And that's the entire level up. You might pick up a feat instead, but usually they pick the most impactful feat at four, and now they're excited to get their stat increased. So it really isn't that much of a game feel difference. Where in Pathfinder, no amount of basic guards can kill a dragon. Everything scales with level. You remember that red dragon I flashed on screen real quick? It had an AC of 45. Yep. No amount of basic guards are hitting that thing, let alone killing it. <laughs> And you can have narratively impossible to kill bad guys that actually threaten entire regions. And then every single level up is like the four to five power spike in D&D. It is massive. So in terms of game... Your mic's cutting out again. Oh, uh, that's because I accidentally bumped it. But every level up, you feel it. Yeah. And you can use the variant rule proficiency without level to get closer to the 5e math and those design goals. Because Pathfinder includes a lot of ways you can modify its rules right out of the box to actually legitimately change the fundamentals. I think proficiency with that level has some issues, but that's for Pathfinder experts to argue about. Uh, And then how they treat magic. D&D, magic can solve just about anything because it is treated as a resource, and resources are supposed to be innately powerful. I'm going to bring up Pass Without Trace, which is concentration, and then just for a length of time, 
you and everybody around you gets a plus 10 to stealth checks as a second level spell. Why have a rogue when the druid can cast Pass Without Trace and then turn to a bird? <laughs> yeah. I mean, clearly it isn't damage because we talked about the summoning a bunch of animals. <laughs> um, so there are cool spells early on in the game. And so they put things like sending way lower than they do in Pathfinder because I'll get to why Pathfinder does later. And magic items are difficult to find and rarely traded. So that way D&D can keep them as like these weird things that you find and keep complexity lower. But that means you're kind of locked into these assumptions because you're picking D&D. Pathfinder assumptions makes you, magic makes you significantly better, but is non-auto win. And the best example is knock. Knock in 5e opens the door. Knock in Pathfinder gives you plus four to bust that door open or pick the lock. And it restricts things like sending to be level five spells and puts different information sending spells at lower ranks. It's like dream message is now a rank three spell, but it only works when somebody is sleeping and they can't respond. <laughs> you only know that the message was sent. So that is how the difference in spells works. So in the PF2 game running right now, the characters actually had a discussion of how are we going to keep in contact? At what frequency do we get checked up on? Do we need to send back a dream message? And they actually had discussed this because it mattered. So magical commodities also just exist in the world. There are things like plus one chef's tools. And you can expect that a great chef would have a plus one chef's knife because people invest in their most prized tools. And so it's very much treated as a commodity that people can just kind of shop around, go to different places and buy these items. And all that's gated to a level. You say, this is the level of the settlement and you say, go wild, buy anything that's common. <laughs> so you can have shopping be between sessions and that's it. So this is how the magic differs between the two. And playing some like D&D means that you are locking yourself into third rank spells can bring back the dead re recent dead. Playing Pathfinder means you're locking yourself into this information game is going to get really weird if we need to start sending messages to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the encounter philosophy is burning resources. Single fights have casters dominate in a thing. Your boss creatures need to have ways to counteract spells, completely locking them down and simplify the numbers. Pathfinder's philosophy says encounters exist to be threats in their own right. And resource expenditure is not a big factor. Single fights have everyone burning their resources just to stay alive. <laughs> Boss creatures do not need any kind of help in Pathfinder. In fact, you can go on the Reddit and people just do nothing but complain about how strong they are because they aren't working as a team. <laughs> and so they keep the bus and debuffs tightly tuned. So that way you do have these teamwork moments. And so when you deal with these games, they each make their own assumptions that come in and manifest in their math. Yeah. All of the rules like games. I can't really talk about them broadly in that way because it's all like they keep their magic vague. So the GM has a choice of what they do with it. They keep their number simple. So that way they let the fiction shine through. They keep their everything else very much in the flavor side of things and then make the flavor matter. So they are less, I can't talk about them in detail until you've really played quite a few. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, and it would be a different talk yeah. if I did, because this is a D&D focused talk. That's why I'm comparing the two similar systems. Mm -hmm. But there is the completely other axis out there. It's just that it would have made this talk go ridiculously over time if I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, I don't see any questions. All right, it seems like we did a lot of talking. Last and I've time, stalled so. enough. Yeah. So I think no, we're kind of, so now we're going to go to a creature review. Creature All right, report. chat. I'm, gonna now, I'm now going to describe what makes a monster fun. And this is for when you're picking creatures for your encounters or when you're designing your own. Because I will go over the 5e encounter or 5e creature building rules. Not going to go over Pathfinder rules because out of scope. Coherent theme is one of the things I listed. Simple to run is something I'm going to get to eventually. Uh, it should make sense somehow. <laughs> It should be interactable. The player should be able to make choices around its abilities because otherwise it's just kind of a wad of numbers. 
And if the players aren't making any decisions about it, how much does it actually matter? Not too simple slash complex, because if it's too simple, it's just a lot of hit points that's eating time until it dies. And if it's too complex, you as the GM are looking at the Lich and Spellist going, what the hell do any of these things do? <laughs> and I'm going to pull up another source book to read through. So that's why there are so few spellcasting monsters. And that's something known as the complexity budget. And so if you go over your complexity budget, they become a pain to run. If you go under your complexity budget, they become a boring fight. And if you're using creature in a group, you have a smaller complexity budget. If it's meant to be a boss, you have a larger complexity budget, which is why Pathfinder gets away with making its dragons like that. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, balance. Not just like raw power. Overly tanky or glass canned enemies can lead to very unsatisfying fights. And I'll get into an example of why tanky enemies are later. But for glass can enemies, it basically comes down to, did the Flame Skull win initiative to fireball my entire party as a level four creature? <laughs> uh, if the, you have run a Flame Skull or a couple Flame Skulls before without reading them thoroughly, they do have a fireball as an innate spell. <clears throat> and if the party is traveling in a ball together, oh boy, they're all in range of fireball if you win initiative but they have no HP on the other side, which is how they are balanced, but they are not balanced in terms of offense and defense. You can, of course, bend these rules. Like, I don't care. I'm not your mom, but it is going to be a thing that you should consider. <laughs> of If you have an enemy that's too far on the glass cannon side, it's either going to go down like a wet fart or completely decimate your party's resources, just like on a coin flip. But if they're overly tanky, you are locking in for a two-hour snooze fest. So, a good example of creature design, I'm going to go for Beholders. Because Beholders actually have an interesting decision to make, and that's because of their anti-magic cone ability. The Beholder's central eye creates an area of anti-magic that disables all spells and magic items, but also protects you from its eye beams, because its eye beams are magical. So you can choose between safety versus... Having this, it can move its icon around so your positioning really matters. And then it's different rays, which, mind you, are random, which I might not like as a entity that's supposed to be incredibly intelligent, having that much randomness in it. So thematically, I think it's kind of weird that way. But as a, like, chaos monster that's doing 10 random different things, all of which require a response of some kind, because you start sleeping, you need somebody to go over there and wake them up. There's... Things you can do about this, for a lot of them, while also doing damage and being a threat, I really like Beholders. Because they hit a lot of those notes that I'm looking for in a monster. And they're not too complex, because you just understand, I roll this and then I read off the effect that happens. And yeah, they have legendary actions, but it's only one legendary action, so it's easy to track. It's not that much complexity for level 13 monster. This is kind of what I'm looking for. So I'm going to put Beholder in as the gold standard. Owlbears are too simple. As I joked about before, their only unique gimmick is keen sight and smell, which I have never heard of coming up. Except for when a druid gets them as a pet and they use them to track something. Um, other than that, they have multi-attack for beak and two claw attacks like every other animal monster. Yeah. So yep. if you were just do a single owlbear as a fight, it becomes a snooze fest. It's not really interesting. And now this could be a good complexity budget for brand new audiences, which is why I think they made it like a lower CR creature. So that way it can be like a newer player's first boss fight. Or it can be used in like a group at higher levels. It's designed for like that niche. And I think it's too simple to really be much more than that. Good against those who hide, um, which is a full action that they aren't using to attack. Unless they're a rogue. Unless they are a rogue, <laughs> in which case they are playing a rogue Omega Lol. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now let's discuss some other creatures. So Fire Elemental, what do we think about it? It has some special abilities. It has some immunities. Fire, poison, makes sense. I mean, like, I don't see how you'd poison that. I don't see how you'd damage it with fire. 
resistance to non-magical attacks. I'm willing to give that a pass because it is magical weird form. And fire form doesn't really come up in combat too much. But creature touch it or hits it, well, within five feet of it takes a D10 of fire damage. And can enter people's spaces for D10s of fire damage. So it's already being built up to be a creature that's trying to run through people to deal damage. And just eat the attacks of opportunity to get into a back line. And then it can do touch attacks, try and hit people, and light them on fire so they're taking damage over time. So it has a lot of ways that it is burning people over time. So you can then hit somebody, burn them, they're taking damage, they try to hit you, they're burning. I actually really like this creature as one that applies damage over time effects. Uh, my, uh, if you're down at that zero HP, I, I, I'm looking at my green circle so I can see when my mic's going out. Okay, good. Uh, it's really scary when you are at low HP because any damage when you're dying is a failed death save. And if you're just at low HP, that damage is going to take you down again. So I actually really like it for punishing the default best hack in 5e. What I don't necessarily like is how it just kind of neuters a bunch of melee marshals, which are already yeah. kind of weak in 5e. So that's my one point against it. On that, I really like it. Now let's go on to water elementals. Water elementals have similar abilities. They can squeeze through people. This time, instead of having weakness, it has a status penalty that's applied if you deal cold damage to it, which I think is cool. I think that's rad. Because I think that weaknesses as a whole in 5e are pretty ridiculously good. <laughs> like, for the players. Um, I really also like how they pull a player into them and then take somebody out of action economy and possibly drown them unless somebody else pulls them out. So they force a decision on the party which I really, really appreciate. And, of course, their Whelm ability is blah, 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 but that's the main gist of this creature. So it makes it the party make a decision, has decent damage. I'm just going to assume the balance is fine for all of these because I don't want to redo the math. Mm -hmm. And now let's talk about the Earth Elemental. You might notice something. It's a lot shorter. Okay, vulnerability of thunder, sure. That's like spells that naturally destroy stone stuff, like shatter. I see the logic. I'm not against it. And, and two main special abilities. Earth Glide, which has it burrow through stuff. And Siege Monster, which has it deal double damage to objects and constructs. Our players... Constructs, Merrick. No. <laughs> if they're hiding in a house, have you ever it heard of a effective? <laughs> it can be effective, or it can just go earth glide through the floorboard. But I guess it could matter if you have an artificer setting up a turret. Maybe. Think that's a scenario where you'd have a construct in the party. But really, is more flavor text ability in the similar way to how the keen sense of the owlbear is a flavor text ability. It could come up in a niche scenario, but it really isn't a main ability. And so I'm going to note, it has 17 AC and a lot of hit points for its level. Yeah. This is where you have a boring tank. And it also enables, if you want to use its special abilities, hit and run tactics that are especially bad because it is burrowing into the ground where you cannot hit it. So if you're using its one special ability that can actually be used every turn, Earth Glide, you are making a really obnoxious, tanky hit and run monster. <laughs> Borderline unbeatable. Uh, this is, is great. <laughs> yeah, and it's also going to take 15 turns of a fight, which is great. Love that. Air Elementals, again, it has a flight. Sure, it can kite people, but all its attacks are melee, so I'm going to forgive it. Because if it flies, it's probably running away. Area damage to want people to not stand near it too much. Good fly speed. I don't have a whole lot to say about air elemental. It's just kind of there. It doesn't live as long as the earth elemental, so I'm not going to dock it too much for being simple. And its whirlwind ability does actually give the player something to think about. So, eh, C tier. 
<laughs> Ivy Hydras. Yeah, we're going, we're not cutting super deep into the monster pool, just kind of giving a lot of examples. Yeah. Hydra has five heads by default. It then uh, talks about how it has had diet each increment 25 HP. And that can have heads regrow and then blah, 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 unless it takes fire damage. Sure. That's you. It's unique thing is you want to be dealing fire damage to it consistently. And that has extra reactions for opportunity attacks per head. Multi-attack with bites. I do want to note one thing. This multi-attack can all target one player and make somebody feel very targeted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it is a player killer fight. Absolutely. Its balance is kind of wacky because it is dealing on average. Uh, I'm going to make sure I get the decimal point right. 52.5. I didn't even need the calculator. I just need a little bit of time. But it's doing that much damage if all of it hits. With a plus eight to hit, which is pretty damn good for its level. Melee player kill. Oh, uh, oh, you're out again. <laughs> Can I get some tape on that thing? Let's see. Okay, I was using it to charge my calculator recently, so I think that was why. Because I didn't fully plug it into the correct port on the PC on the back, I guess. <laughs> but I'm going to compare this to the Pathfinder Hydra which gives you a choice of if you're targeting the head or not. It has the regeneration actually regenerate its HP. If it does regrow a head, it has multiple opportunity attacks as you would in the 5e monster. It's just using more words because it's being very specific about how it interacts with things like Vorpal Swords. Because they, for some reason, care about that, despite that being like a level 16 item in case they make something down the line. Or a GM makes it so that they have a rule for it. Because that's a common yeah. theme of Pathfinder. And then it has Storm of Jaws, which lets it make a bite at full accuracy. Because in Pathfinder, the more attacks you make in turn, the lower your accuracy gets. To hit everybody within reach of you up to the amount of heads you have. So that way you're spreading out the damage and causing things there. And each gun's a different target. Blah, blah, blah. Or it can do a focus assault where it adds a, an amount of damage per extra head it has onto a single player so that it can still have all the heads target one person, but does not like insta kill them because Pathfinder bosses have a tendency to really kill people quite fast. <laughs> yes. Hydras are a cool creature, and I do have some, I also have some balance problems with uh, both Hydras because if you don't have fire damage, you're screwed. Yeah. Like, pretty damn screwed if you don't have fire damage against both hydras and the pathfinder one at least get, lets you have the choice of like acid damage which this one doesn't so sure but it is meant to be a puzzle monster and i think both do their job really well now let's talk about zombies how do they tell their theme? Slower move speed, a lot of hit points, very easy to hit. All right. And also they have this ability to, they can keep on coming back because they're so hard to kill permanently. Sure. And then they have a very, very weak main attack. So that way you can use them in a swarm and not feel bad about it. Pathfinder zombies, they do more damage, can get a free grab have a faster move speed, like the same move speed as normal players, and if they grab you, they can bite your head with a Jaws attack. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But they only have two actions per turn instead of the normal three in Pathfinder, and that's how they get the slowness across. Which thus makes kiting tactics very efficient against them, because if you notice, the Hydra had attack for opportunity written in on its stat block. The zombie shambler doesn't, because that's not a given, so you can very easily run away from them. So they can be used in an encounter. If they do swarm you and start grabbing you, it's going to be very hard to get out of their total stuff. And then they can go in with a Jaws attack and actually eat your brains. Eat your brains. <laughs> very cool. So I prefer the uh, Pathfinder version of the Zombie Shambler, even though they're both simple takes on this creature. Because I think the D&D &D one is, again, leaning in the, this should take a while to kill. 
and you need to figure out a way to ignore it while you deal with more important stuff first. Where the zombie shambler Pathfinder says, you really shouldn't ignore me if I'm standing next to you. Or you just run away, but... <laughs> so it's, you can still run away, but it then forces you to think, okay, this creature, despite being so low level, is actually a threat if it's starting its turn next to me. Yeah. Because moving is an action, Pathfinder. So now for 5e custom monsters, I just, I'm just going to say use the website. I'm not going to bother running through the actual things of the Dungeon Master Guide. And I will note a couple interesting things about the math of 5e monsters. You notice how there's a lot of special abilities. <laughs> not working still like the default ones Sorry. that a lot of creatures would have and they just kind of give you a little bonus to effective damage a little bonus to effective hp and that won't be fully accurate because there are ways you can design a kit to be way better than you'd otherwise expect like you give a creature a few resistances and then regeneration that regeneration is on average going to be more impactful. But this calculator won't tell you that. Mm -hmm. So you still need to be careful, but it will give you a number that will ballpark your CR. And it will show you what is your offensive balance versus your defensive balance. Which is useful data, because some other calculators will just give you one number. And that doesn't give you the feedback of, did I accidentally make a glass cannon? Yeah, the damage severity in, in 5e, that's the one thing that they did kind of do math on. Um, <laughs> like, traps yeah. are scaled for level, that is true. Yeah. Like, 5e has all of its scaling come from HP and damage increases, and very rarely an accuracy or AC increase. Yeah. Where Pathfinder has a lot of its math come from the scaling attack modifier and ac while there's the i can go into pathfinder's math in detail it's very very smart how it's designed but out of scope for the conversation mm -hmm. and so here you just kind of if you're making custom ability guesstimate how much damage per round it's worth and type it in i wish there's a better explanation but like it really is a lot of guesstimations and then ballparking you're really just kind of oh apparently it's on the cr i wanted okay good enough <laughs> yeah which is unfortunate but uh that's kind of how a lot of 5e balancing for, goes on the gm side so this is the calculator i like using for 5e when i'm making custom monsters for when i need my fourth mega trask because i need bosses in my level 20 game because mm -hmm. you know <laughs> base trask can be killed by a level one cleric if they have a fly speed make godzilla <laughs> Just do Godzilla. It works. So, any creature questions? Question. Have you made Godzilla? <laughs> I have made a Godzilla-type monster because that was a Magic the Gathering-themed game, and I oh, ended cool. up making the green Praetor, who is kind of like that, and I end up needing to give him range attack-type stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was kind of justifying it by like, oh, he grows a bunch of spikes and throws it, but you could easily just throw a laser beam on him for the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. So like I had built like a creature that took up like an eight by eight thing on roll twenty and like whatever. But Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Okay. Um Yeah, cool encounters also make players feel right. cool. Uh, I'm reading yes. the, the chat. Okay. Um, someone having an encounter of a water elemental covering a troll as it chased the players. That is interesting. That's, yeah, cool imagery and stuff is important for a monster, not just, like, a bunch of abilities yeah. and stats. Yeah. I'm focusing on the, that's the balance thing I like. I like the question, what does balance mean between GMs and players? Because that means different things depending on your table, depending on your system, depending on your group expectations. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and true. what I'm going to say, the number one thing is, a lot of the time, you want the players to feel like, oh man, this fight matters. 
whatever balance lets you get to the players feel like this fight matters is the balance you should go for. If that means you need to threaten to kill a player, so be it. If it means that you just need to threaten like a decent chunk of damage, great. And balance should help you get to those marks. That's what it means between GM and player. Because obviously, if the GM wanted to, they could just win by throwing Mm -hmm. five ancient dragons at you. And which yeah. dragons are best to run? Um, depends on your system. Depends on your goals. That's like, a whole boring answer. Presentation. But I can actually. That's handle a whole that can one. of worms. If we if we get to the end and you're still around, I will pull up all the dragons of Five E. <laughs> and I can tell you at least for Five E. So the best Pathfinder dragons. dragons, we have fifteen of them, and we're gonna get four more in the new Monster Core book. So we're. <laughs> We have a lot of dragons if we want to cover them. My favorite is, of course, the magma dragon because they sleep in volcanoes and that's rad. Um, I think if I was to do like a like a which dragons are best to run in short, uh, like the the ba- the main idea is look for an ability that's not just um, breathe fire. Like um, mm-hmm. there is a I think there's like a a dragon supplement book that gives them the spells back from um from the older editions which is like the mm-hmm. best thing because dragons having innate spell casting is super cool and i don't know why they took it away i mean for simplification reasons but i think that's lame simplicity yep i um, do too dragons should be epic and overpowered and stupid which is why uh yeah they have the whiz bangs book i think that was the name of the supplement yeah that was after i left that but in the pathfinder core books they have innate spell casting on the martially dragons and then they have another dragon template with a pre-built spell list and what abilities to remove to make it a caster dragon yeah but yeah i wouldn't run dragons for low level though just because the wormlings suck because they're too simple in my opinion they just have fire breathe and hit yeah so you might as well just run something else but at higher levels you get crazy stuff that's really cool like solar and lunar dragons. Yeah, look, look at those. Those are really fun. I love both. Solar of them. and lunar are great. But lunar so, is yeah. bullshit. So. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh. <laughs> it's a dragon. Yeah. I'd go on about the young white dragon, how stupid it is in terms of balance and Pathfinder. It's one of the few Pathfinder monsters I actually have a rant on. It's that and the uh, water genies for being too simple. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, the water genies gave me 5e flashbacks with their amount of abilities. Uh, oh no. So that made me very All sad. Right, let's see. Because they can how do so many is, more cool things with them. How much is left in this presentation? That answer oh. your question? I think it does. Okay. So All right, let's wrap here's this what up. to do to make 5e encounters shine on average provide an alternate lose condition, as in the thief gets away with the jewels. Somebody, an NPC gets hit, you know, all those types of things. Make sure your creatures are interactive so that the players do something responding to these creatures. Force an interesting choice or cool moment. Don't kill anyone too often is usually a main goal. Because 5e character building is actually a lot for uh, people that don't know the system well. And needing them to go through that every session is a pain. If you, that's one of your goals, check out the OSR systems. Yep, takes too long. Exactly. Shout out to Morkborg for having character creation come from rolling four dice on the table. Um, make sure you're still willing to kill people, you know? they. If you want that to be a threat, you need to make sure you're still willing to attack a downed body, you know? Yeah. And then do that six to eight times a day to fill up the encounter budget to make sure casters aren't broken. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and you need to apply time pressure to make sure they don't long rest after three of them. I think that's a session zero conversation, in my opinion, but we don't have to get too much into that. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, I I like Pathfinder because I can tell my players, do everything in your power to actually beat these encounters. Yeah. And that's, like, fun. Mm -hmm. It is a lot of work. Don't feel bad that it's hard because it's not just you that finds it hard. 5e made a lot of deliberate design decisions that happened to have the GM carry a heavy load. Making D&D 5e combat shine is hard. Is the effort worth it? Learning another system isn't as hard as one would think, 
but it's also a lot to get the, all your players to learn that new system. However, I would recommend trying these new systems out. Because at worst, you're going to have another angle to approach 5e encounters from. Yeah. At best, you find another game that you might enjoy as well, and that's like good. And again, worst case, you learn what you can steal or learn what you don't like. Boom. Nice. I, and Thank then I put you my so YouTube much. channel banner. Thank you so much, Sean. This is a great time. Um, that is, I think that's going to technically wrap up our official, um, because it is about yep. 8.30. But if you would mind... Our official time slot ends screen. in one, zero. Nice. <laughs> I'll keep sharing my screen. Okay. Um, here, we will... I'll definitely here link your link your uh disc or not your Discord, your YouTube in the chat. And then um I, I want to share a because we're talking about dragons and I have lots of opinions on dragons and I think it's fascinating.